So welcome to our introduction to Chapter 42. We're just going to give a brief presentation today of how circulation systems differ in different animals. We're going to spend most of our time talking about how vertebrate circulation systems in particular are different and how things have changed over evolutionary history. So just to start out, not all animals actually have a circulation system. Um, in some cases, animals like sponges, um, also the cnidarians, um, that includes animals like sea anemones and jellyfish, uh, they don't actually have any kind of blood or blood vessels or circulation system at all. Um, their bodies are set up such that basically all of their body cells um, are, are very closely contacting uh, seawater around them. Um, and they can bring all of the materials that they need into each body cell through just simple diffusion um, with the environment around it. Um, that's not very typical of most other animals, though. Um, so we're going to see this trend toward a circulatory system in most other animals. Um, perhaps as the animal body plan got bigger, uh, thicker, um, deeper, um, those body cells kind of deeper inside the body are going to need a circulation system to deliver the materials that are needed um, to keep the cell alive. So we're going to see circulation systems in most other creatures. Um, there is a basic distinction between open and closed circulation that I'll briefly go through. Uh, as it turns out, not all animals have um, tubes um, that, that lead blood all around the body. Um, they still have a heart pump um, here um, that pushes the liquid around and keeps it moving, um, but it very quickly exits through a very simple set of tubes, and I want you to just to imagine that this circulatory liquid um, just kind of bathes all of the body organs and body cells. Um, it can be pushed um, perhaps to respiratory centers to pick up new oxygen and to drop off carbon dioxide, uh, so it still works, um, but there's just no tubing leading everywhere. Um, so we just say that that's an open circulatory system. Uh, we tend to find this in, in smaller um, animals. So there are some mollusk groups. Um, that includes um, animals like clams and snails and, and uh, animals like that. Um, also insects um, might have more typical open circulatory systems. Uh, but by and large, most animals um, that we're going to discuss at least have a closed circulatory system. Uh, so we still have that heart pump that creates the push um, that pushes liquid into other liquid and keeps it moving around the body. Um, except in this case, it's a closed system because that liquid um, always stays contained within some kind of tubing. Um, we'll generally talk more about arteries and capillaries and veins um, at, a, at a later time um, in a future video. Um, but that's the basic closed system um, for our purposes right now. So uh, we're going to talk specifically about the vertebrate circulatory system in this video. Um, and I'm interested in just kind of tracing how the vertebrate circulation has changed. Um, we're going to talk about three major groups um, to think about and how things have changed. We're going to start with the fish circulatory system and how it's set up and how it's fairly basic and maybe a problem with it um, that it later lands land vertebrates. Um, we think the first land vertebrates were the amphibians. Um, these include things like frogs and salamanders. Um, how they have changed in order to uh, uh, improve upon that problem with the fish system. As it turns out, it creates a solution, but it also creates a new problem that uh, later mammals and birds are going to evolve to fix. Um, uh, mammals include anything like the uh, anything with hair or fur, like um, the cow, mice, um, cats, dogs, humans, um, and also birds um, have this uh, solution as well. Um, the balance of evidence suggests that perhaps mammals and birds um, evolved this solution independent of each other. Um, as it turns out, reptiles are vertebrates as well, and uh, your book does briefly put um, reptiles in this story. I'm going to leave reptiles out for the most part because uh, different reptiles um, are somewhat like amphibians and that they sort of have their system um, without the solution that mammals and birds have. Other reptiles are more like mammals and birds, and then, interestingly enough, some reptiles are sort of in between um, with the solution that we're going to uh, eventually present. Um, so I'm not as concerned with reptiles and where exactly they sit. Um, they sort of show this interesting evolutionary half transition uh, between the, the major event between amphibians and mammals and birds. 
So let's get to it. Um, this is kind of a basic schematic of what a fish circulation system might look like. Um, it's something that we would call a single loop circulation system. Um, the blood goes to the heart to be pumped, um, but the heart only pumps it once in the overall circuit. Um, in this case, the uh, heart is going to pump blood toward the gills. Remember that fish are going to be aquatic, um, so they have gills to reoxygenate their blood. That blood is then just sort of delivered without going back to the heart uh, again um, to the body in um, circulation. Um, the oxygen is dropped off and then the blood returns to the heart. Um, all of these schematics are going to use this red-blue system, blue for deoxygenated blood, red for oxygenated blood. Uh, blood doesn't actually look like that when it's deoxygenated. Um, it doesn't look blue. It's actually kind of a dark red. Um, your vessel walls are blue, especially if you are, are pale like me. You might be able to see them um, particularly well. Um, but those are your vessel walls, not your actual blood um, within them. But blue versus red is pretty easy to see. So so I'm willing to keep going with that in this uh, particular video. Um, so that's the basic fish system. What's the problem with this system? Uh, the problem is that the blood travels rather slowly especially if you get further and further away from the heart. Um, so the heart pumps, and with that, that pump from the ventricle, uh, blood travels very fast, uh, but as you get further and further away from the source of the pump, uh, so maybe especially as blood is traveling from the gills toward the, the body cells, um, it's going to be tremendously slow here because it's so far away from the source of the original pump. Um, fluid is still pushing on other fluid, but it's also meeting resistance distance from the vessel walls, um, and so things are slowing down. Um, and uh, by the time it finally gets back to the heart, it's, it's extremely slow, and then it's going to be pumped back out again. So uh, how does the amphibian circulatory system fix this? Um, here is a basic schematic of the amphibian system. Um, the new innovation is they have what we call a double loop circulatory system. Um, or the key idea here is that once again, there is a ventricle part of the heart that pumps the blood toward the lungs, um, uh, lungs in this case um, because amphibians are going to be on land, um, as adults anyway. Um, the blood gets reoxygenated, but this time it goes back to the heart, uh, and the heart pumps it a second time, uh, pumps it to the body cells, um, uh, unlike what we saw in fish. So it gets there faster. Uh, and then when the blood um, uh, uh, is and the oxygen is delivered to the body cells, it's going to travel back to the heart to be pumped to the lungs again. So this idea of a double loop circulation is simply the idea that the heart pumps twice in one circuit. Uh, it pumps to the lungs, and, and then the lung, uh, uh, after that, it returns back to the heart to be pumped to the body. And so blood gets everywhere faster in this system. That's definitely the, the big advantage of this system. Uh, as it turns out, it actually creates a new problem, though, that the fish never had. Uh, because two types of blood are now coming back to the heart, uh, the blue blood is coming back to the heart, just like it did in the fish, uh, but also the freshly oxygenated red blood is now coming back as well. Um, and there's just this one common ventricle in the middle where potentially some of that blood might actually get mixed. Um, so some of the, uh, certainly most of the blue blood is still sent toward the lungs because that's sort of the area um, where it comes from. Uh, most of the red blood is sent to the body, um, but there is some admixture. Um, and that can actually potentially be problematic, um, especially if you think of sending bl some blue blood toward the body cells uh, and they don't have any oxygen to deliver. As it turns out, this apparently works for amphibians, uh, but not for energetically demanding mammals and birds. We're going to talk next unit about what makes mammals and birds so demanding of energy. Uh, the brief answer is that they are endotherms. Endothermy carries advantages to it, but it's also much more um, energy demanding. Uh, and so their body cells are going to require more oxygen. They need to do more respiration um, on average uh, than, say, an amphibian. So 
So uh, how are they going to be even more efficient? Uh, they retain the double loop circulation that the amphibian system had with its advantage of being faster. Um, and they're going to fix the problem of mixture of the two types of blood um, by simply having this wall-like structure in the heart. Uh, your book calls that the septum. Um, that prevents the blue and red blood from mixing. So here is a, a blue blood returning back from the body. It comes back to an atrium, the sort of entryway to a heart. Uh, the atrium feeds the ventricle, and the ventricle only pumps that blue blood to where it needs to go, to the lungs. Uh, uh, the, the blood picks up oxygen at the capillaries surrounding the lungs and returns back to the heart, back to the other side of the heart, um, returning again to an atrium that feeds the ventricle. Uh, but this ventricle now only pumps um, to the body. So uh, red blood always gets to where it needs to go fast because it's a double loop circulation. Blue blood always gets to where it needs to go fast. Um, things are getting places fast and um, to the correct place so the overall system is more efficient. Okay, so that's really it. Just a, a very brief introduction to different circulatory systems. Um, hopefully you can just kind of uh, summarize for me when circulatory systems very broadly evolved. Uh, maybe you could justify to me why all um, not all animals have circulation systems. How can certain animal groups do without circulation systems? Um, and then we mostly focused on the evolutionary history of the vertebrate circulation. Um, evidence for a common ancestry. Um, also some slight evidence to see which groups might be more related um, to us than others. Um, something we'll have to um, justify with other evidence later.